Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar about increasing developer efficiency with Up9 and Rookout. Um, my name is Noga. I'm here for Up9, the automated microservice testing platform. And today we have two wonderful speakers, Rafael Botbolweis and Josh Hendrick. And I will tell you a bit about these wonderful speakers and then tell you um, a bit about what we're going to do today and then pass it on to them. So we have Josh from Up9. Josh is a senior solutions engineer at Rookout. Um, he's worked at quite a large number of companies um, that specialize in software development and in DevOps related technologies. And most importantly, he really loves what he does. And we know that because he loves discovering new tech, which is always a nice thing to know about a person. Over the years, he's been an avid traveler and he's consulted um, across the world with a number of technology firms in places like Hong Kong, Australia, and across Europe which I'm sure he misses now, but hopefully <laughs> he'll be able to get back to that, um, not, not in the too far away future. And if you catch him during his free time, you'll find him practicing Tai Chi, playing guitar and producing music, um, which is a really nice uh, thing to note about him. And together with Josh, we have Rafael, um, which I've known for many years. Um, and I can tell you that he's a really great and talented person. He's the VP customer experience here at Up9. He has more than 20 years of experience in innovative enterprise software. Uh, before Up9, he was the head of customer experience at Broadcom. Um, that was the company that acquired uh, BlazeMeter, um, which was a performance testing startup, which he was also a founding team member of. And he also founded Blaze Labs, which was BlazeMeter's open source solutions for developers. So those are the two speakers that you'll be hearing today. Um, just a bit about housekeeping. So after the webinar, you will get the recording in an email that we'll send out. Um, we will have a Q&A session in the end, um, but you can ask at any time. If you look at the bottom bar, there is a Q&A button. You can just press on it and uh, ask your question. I'll be gathering all the questions and asking them um, at the end um, at some time that we have saved for that. We have two polls throughout the webinars. We'd really appreciate if you fill them out. We'll just take a short pause um, from the speakers. The, the poll will pop up and you'll be able to fill it out. It will help us a lot to get a really good picture about, um, about, uh, about the developer market to help us uh, create better content for you. And just to add on that, we will be sending out a survey in the end and we would really appreciate if you filled it out. Um, we wanna know what we did well, what we didn't do so well so we can create better webinars for you in the future. So with that, I am going to pass it on to Josh and Rafael, and I hope you enjoy your evening or morning or day, wherever you are in the world. Perfect. Thank you, Noga. Pre appreciate it. Um, so just to kind of introduce what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, so again, my name is Josh Hendrick. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what we're here to talk about is a little bit about uh, developer efficiency, right? That, that's an area I think most organizations are focused on, um, really empowering developers to be as efficient and make the best use of their time as possible, right? So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that are typically hurting developer efficiency, some interesting statistics that uh, that we've gathered. Um, where developers typically spend most of their time, if you guys are developers, I'm sure you're well aware, but some of the things that we typically hear from customers um, and some of those areas, why they're important and, and how we can potentially improve upon them. Um, and then specifically looking at, um, issues and defects that developers encounter. Oftentimes they're incredibly hard to reproduce. Um, they can be they can be challenging to kind of track down, pinpoint, and then remediate. So we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, and then potentially what we can do about it uh, with shifting, uh, shifting testing left of microservices, um, having some abilities to do things like remote debugging, uh, we'll, we'll talk about. And then we'll actually take you through a hands-on demo where we'll dive into the technology itself and kind of show you how it works in a real world uh, scenario. Basically making your time less focused on other stuff and more about copy. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, <laughs> perfect. Couple interesting, um, interesting statistics. Um, so we recently asked uh, about 150 developer uh, and DevOps managers, uh, folks that are actually out there building cloud native applications. Um, they're leveraging DevOps technologies. So they're doing a lot of automation, CI, CD, uh, test automation. We asked them, you know, on average, how long does it take to solve customer issues? Um, and 52% of them said it takes one to two days. Um, and 48% said it takes even more. And this is kind of interesting. If you if you looked at this number probably you know five to ten years ago, I would guess that these would be 
a lot larger um, just because uh, of the kind of leaps and bounds and efficiency we've we've continued to make over the past number of years. But I, but looking at the requirements from businesses today to operate quickly, to solve issues faster, um, those are still too long, right? We want to get those down as, as low as we can. Um, and, and so uh, just thought it was kind of interesting in terms of, of, of how long things take. We've, it's not uncommon to hear from our customers that they have uh, uh, defects that last for weeks, months, even heard years uh, at, at times, defects that go un unsolvable in those environments. Um, so kind of jumping on to the, to the next slide here, where do developers typically spend most of their time? Um, I thought this was an interesting tweet. 90% of coding is debugging. The, only, the other 10% is writing bugs. Um, so developers, you know, from that, developers uh, are spending a lot of their time um, doing things like trying to reproduce issues in their environments, responding to, to incidents. Um, a, a lot, uh, one metric that a lot of organizations are tracking these days is MTTR, which is the mean time to repair when something goes wrong and, and uh, developers need to jump in to fix those issues, right? Um, and then they're spending time on, once they identify issues, they're spending time remediating the, those issues, spending time improving the code, doing things like refactoring, maintaining uh, legacy code, uh, testing those features is a big thing, um, which uh, uh, Rafael is definitely gonna talk more about during, during the presentation. Um, supporting customers, finding manual tasks and uh, automating those things, and all while trying to understand all of these different moving pieces, especially in microservices architectures where there's a lot of different services running and a lot of uh, places where things can potentially go wrong, uh, where developers want to be spending their most, most of their time and, and the business wants them to be is around developing new features, doing things that add value uh, to customers. Okay. And one thing about that is that, you know, if we look at the 25% uh, of the time developers spend, uh, we all know like, uh, hey, there is a bug. What do you talk about? It works for me locally, right? So trying to mimic that bug and trying to figure out what the environment for that, it's uh, these days, it's really hard to do it all because of the complexity as well. So if in the past we had our, you know, monolith, we could easily do it on our staging environment or, you know, uh, if, if somebody here is from the PS organization, before you went and implemented something into a customer, you've done it in your lab, right? Because you wanted to mimic that. Today, sometimes you can't even do it in your lab. It has to be like, you know, how do you do a Lambda in your lab or something like that? Um, so it only increased the MTTR. And we're here for the customers, basically, right? When your customer has a pain, you know, we just want to get the job done for the customers to be happy and progress with whatever they need to do for their business. So uh, today we're gonna show you uh, a cool demo that uh, is gonna help you a little bit with how to debug stuff and uh, do it uh, and find the bugs locally. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so kind of looking at why defects are so hard to reproduce. Um, there's, there's a lot of different um, circumstances that can come into play when you're trying to go about reproducing issues, right? One big thing is the environment. Um, so, you know, are you discovering a defect in production and then trying to reproduce that in a lower environment, like a staging environment or a development environment where configuration drift can potentially happen? So it's, it's important to use things like configuration as code, configuration management systems to be able to track those configurations and ensure that they're consistent across all of your environments. Uh, network conditions can be different. Maybe there's things that certain that only happen under heavy load or, or specific uh, traffic into your applications. One of the biggest ones that we hear about is uh, customer specific data, right? So data in production is not always the same as it is in staging. And most of the time it's not especially with you know, GDPR and all of these uh, data privacy requirements, a lot of times organizations are masking that data in production and using different data in their test environments. And it makes uh, reproducing those issues uh, challenging. Uh, oftentimes code can differ, schema versions can differ inadvertently. Sometimes you don't realize you're testing another version of the schema. Maybe there's a, a, a defect within another system that's on a, a specific schema version that you're trying to track down. Um, and then lastly, lack of modern tooling, right? Developers need the latest and greatest tools to be able to kind of drill in uh, to potential issues they're discovering in their environment. 
I try to debug a Lambda feature, uh, a hard one. And also if you have, you know, a Kafka and someone puts a message in the Kafka bus, which is breaking the schema, suddenly lots of the services that are just subscribed to that topic start shouting at you. You see it from your APM and you kind of say to yourself, only if there could be a way for the developer to know that they are pushing a message, right? That is going to break the schema, right? We have that in uh, in REST for years, right? 400 bad requests. Um, that's the thing. We are in a, the, the technology here in the last 10 years, you know, with Kubernetes and Docker, we ship faster, we adapt ourselves to be able to get the developers all the way to production. Um, but we always care about the quality and we also want to get the, we got, want to get the throughput, but not compromise on the quality. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And I think, I think we've all been on, anyone that's been a developer at a large organization, we've been on these large group conference calls where there's five, six different teams all trying to track down an issue. And um, those are never fun, especially when they're on weekends. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, why, so, so, so continuing on why it's hard to reproduce issues, right? You know, I think one of the biggest um, factors that can make a difference in terms of making issues a little bit easier to track down is having, having a deep level of observability um, into the application, into the environment um, where things, things are going wrong, right? Um, obviously, if you, if you can't track down that issue and understand kind of the area of your infrastructure uh, or, or code that, ha that has the problem, um, it can be extremely hard to solve, right? And so there's all these different pieces that come into play. There's the application state, talked about the versions, user data, external dependencies, user configurations, um, all of these things, uh, you know, come into play. Um, and you have to think of a lot of different factors when you're prioritizing uh, tracking down these issues as well. It, it takes a lot of effort from developers. There's a potential cost involved, not, not just in terms of, of money, but in terms of time um, developers are taking. Um, a lot of organizations are focusing on improving developers' quality of life, giving them the tools they need to not have to spend all of their time on the weekends and the evenings to debug issues. Um, when you're fixing these, you have to take into account security, uh, performance of your application. Are you introducing side effects when you uh, introduce a fix to the uh, defects? So there's all of these different moving pieces that, that can make it challenging. Um, perfect, so we have a, a, our first poll. Uh, I think Noga is going to going to send that out to the team. Awesome, there and there it is. Um, so, how much time do you spend testing and reproducing issues? So, be curious from from your experience, um, how much of your your time in terms of day to day are you actually actually spending? Our uh, our developer in the demo is probably going to put none, as they're coding <laughs> every time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. So we'll give everyone a couple minutes to uh, to respond to that one. Uh, hopefully, you know it's not more than fifty percent, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people are answering that. Uh, you know, ideally we want to be under ten percent or even better none. But let's see. Well, so I think as if we put a bug in production, but no one actually used that feature. Is, is, does that count as a bug? It's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, right? Is it, uh, did it make a sound? So while you're, um, while everyone is finishing up the poll, we will uh, pop up the results as soon as, uh, as soon as everyone uh, is done with that. Um, kind of move on talk a little bit about shift left uh, and contract testing. Yes, and um, so that's the, that diagram kind of shows, I think, uh, the evolution of the amount of moving parts that we had uh, on the, at least on the application side. I don't know about the hardware side, but uh, we started all the way there in uh, with mainframe. We had like one big computer. Uh, then we moved into uh, enterprise applications, 90s, uh, a little bit more. And uh, we, you know we have the things like the office and the client server model. 2000 came in, 
mobile start kicking in that uh, product uh, i i something i i iphone iphone i think iphone something like that which blew up the entire industry who did thought that we'll have a computer accessible to get all the information that we need in, in the palm of our hand ah, the palm of our hand um and then you know we started with the cloud and the cloud became mature and we saw organizations building their entire infrastructure on the cloud provider. Like for example, BokMe is a great experience for that. Netflix, when they started, they were all based on just AWS. Uh, and today with cloud native, we see the, that traction goes on and exponentially uh, increase with the amount of um, elements of your application. So you think you're writing a code, but you're, you, that code is a part of a really complex multi-service or microservices uh, infrastructure. Uh, which introduced an, a new type of challenge for quality, because if we had just a couple of services, then end-to-end -end test through the UI was good enough. But today, when, it, when you have 100, 200 services in a single environment, you have a BFF, which is the back and forth the front end, or another API gateway, something you have eight, two API gateways, then you have the front end. When you do a change to your API, it's really hard to launch a UI test from the GUI to actually test that and see the exact results that you will need. So developers, especially on the backend and the server side, are left with unit tests or write some kind of a functionals for the API, which again, waste their time to do that, uh, write all those tests. Some of them are trivial, some of them complicated. They need to do that on their own. It's not going to scale. So what happened is that People started hiring more and more people. It doesn't scale. Uh, performance teams uh, hit the testing of the performance all the way at the, the end of, it, of that. Too many commits, too many services got changed by the time you ran the performance test. It's tough. So what we what we actually think of doing in like a methodology, and uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Absolutely. Um, uh, is come up with a new way to develop uh, uh, our software, at least not developing, but uh, the process of what a service will be. And it's basically defining a contract. And contract testing has been there for quite some time. And the idea is that you as a provider, uh, you or the team is the owner of that service. When you develop that service, you have a contract can be a swagger, it can be any type of documentation that basically like in a restaurant tells you the menu, right? Which endpoint I'm going to expose to you, how they look like, what is the schema, what is the request and what is the response that you wanna see from that, uh, uh, to get from that endpoint. And sometimes multiple response, right? You can have 201, 206, please lower your threshold, those kind of things. The second thing are the tests. So I will provide the test the negative, positive, everything resilient as part of my contract. Why? Because if your service is dependent and is that if you're building a service which you need to uh, inject tests from another service, you can now harness those tests and test them. So when you do when you do a code change to your service, you can test other services using their tests and make sure that you didn't break anything. No regression. The regression actually happens on that particular moment that you run that. And another thing is the contract virtualization. And we talked about a lot of services today. Some of the best practices are let's have a Kubernetes cluster and a namespace per team. And then sometimes you need to do something that is kind of destructive for the entire team. So you create another namespace just for that. And oh, I forgot to, uh, uh, to uh, resize the cluster. You spend a lot of resources on that. Or sometimes it just becomes so cluttered that you need to reset everything and get, kind of get the main branch again on all, a lot of DevOps activities. With Mox, you enable a couple of things. One is you can have all the dependencies for your service work on your local computer because they just, it's lightweight and it's easy to do. The second thing is that the, the Mox quickly allows you to uh, experiment with that. So for example, if you take the testing and the mock of a service that you're going to work with, you can experiment quickly with the test and the mock to get the code that you need. And the third thing, the mocks allow you to run multiple profiles. So for example, if I'm just developing against Josh service, I take Josh contract, spin up the mock on my end, and I can interact with the happy path profile of the mock as I'm just developing. But once I've finished the development and I wanna test, 
I can use the negative testing of the mock that Josh provided me to kind of see what happened if I'll get 500 sometimes. And then more of a resilient performance, a little bit of chaos. Uh, Josh defines that and I know my code will be resilient because it passes all those tests and it works with Josh. So the chances it will fail all the way to production are slim. And another thing about profiling is that thing that maybe you need to support like, you know, uh, latest, latest minus one, latest minus two of that version of uh, Josh, right? So instead of deploying, deploying Josh's service three times each time with different service, just think of it one service. What happens if I have 10 of them, right? The metrics is crazy. Uh, metric score is coming, but that's not the right metric. Um, the, uh, so what I can do with mocks is literally just Take those versioning and test them locally with me, lightweight and easy to do all on my laptop. So you don't need Kubernetes and namespaces just for that. Uh, less work on the DevOps team and um, easy to do. Um, you want to show how the debugging goes into that? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for the transition. And uh, yeah, so, so kind of hand in hand with that, right, is the ability to in addition to kind of testing earlier on more often, um, being able to go into applications and um, a lot of organizations are really focusing on observability, being able to go in, um, get deeper levels of information from their applications, right? So having the ability to remotely debug an application is, is critical, right? If you think of the way that you traditionally debug an application in your local IDE, you bring up your source code, you set breakpoints, uh, you collect data about all of the local variables and information about the underlying state of your application while it's running. Um, a lot of organizations are moving to getting a similar experience when they're running their applications remotely, right? So, um, and that's one thing that we're going to look at in the demo today is how we can actually go about doing this on-demand debugging uh, so developers can get data from their application exactly when they need it in the environment that it's occurring. So you no longer have the need to have to add more logs or reproduce things locally uh, in your own development environment. You can go directly into production if you wanted to uh, and set what we call, we'll take a look at them in, in a little bit, uh, non-breaking breakpoints, which allow you to, to collect all of this data on the fly without doing any coding, without having to redeploy your application or change it in any way. So the nice thing is you can you can debug live applications either in development, staging, really really any, any environment across production. Um, it allows you to kind of get a little bit more insight into solving those bugs that we talked about earlier, right? Where it, there's data dependencies, right? In the environment and there's, uh, you know, maybe configuration issues. You can go right into that environment and without having to worry about uh, having to reproduce the issue uh, in a separate uh, location. So let's um, let's take a look at uh, how this how this really works all together, um, all of these different pieces that we've been uh, talking about it. Um, so for the demo flow, uh, Raphael, do you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the demo flow? Yeah, so basically what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to be a, a new uh, developer in Josh's uh, team. And uh, Josh is testing me with, uh, we found a bug. One of our customer kind of uh, reported a bug and I'm going to fix that bug, uh, commit new code to my cluster. Um, I don't think I need regression tests. So I'm going to just show Josh that everything works and just uh, uh, go, go and uh, ask permission to push it into prod. Uh, might need some debugging there. I'm not sure, we'll see. Uh, and if we have some debugging, we'll push the code back, run the regression test and enjoy some coffee. So. Perfect. Perfect. Let's 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 do it. And uh, my prediction is we'll have a lot of time at the end to enjoy uh, some coffee, and I will hand it over to you, uh, Raphael, to to kick it off. Awesome. So th thank you, Josh. And uh, just a quick uh, explanation to uh, can you see my screen? Right, everybody can see my screen. All good. All good. So uh, uh, this is my Kubernetes cluster, and I'm going to just uh, use that to initiate a couple of commands to it. Uh, that's my, uh, our uh, company. Josh and I are working on the, the soft top company. Amazing, by the way, great sauce. Uh, um, and uh, that is our uh, infrastructure. And uh, what I want to do is I want to uh, just debug um, an issue that one of our customers reported. So the issue is if you go to shipping and you try to put an invalid card ID, when you execute that, it works. And we, we don't agree to that. Like you need to have a, a valid GUID here. 
regardless if it comes from another service or directly from the front end, we need to figure that bug. So what I did is basically I developed uh, a piece of code. I just introduced that to shipping and I don't believe in those, you know, predefined variable or functions that actually test UUID. I'm really good at regex. I love regex. So I created a regex to verify this uh, ID. And of course, if the match is found, then we found a match and we will put it back into the shipping. If not, we will respond with a bad request. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to basically push my uh, code. So what I did is kind of prepare the Docker for that. And we see that uh, the new image is here. Look at that. And um, by, by the way, what you see here is uh, up nine, and this is against the real environment in, in that case. Uh, all those tests were created automatically by a machine. So I didn't have to do, and this is why the try now, I can actually go to the traffic and even take something from the traffic itself. Um, ready for me to go here. So I'll prepare that. Let's ruin this ID. And I think we are, yeah, SSL is up. So let's execute. 400, I'm good. Let's push this to prod. Yes. Hold on, hold on. I fixed hold the bug. <laughs> it's Before now we just it's push it right. 400. Come on, I need to go home. Before we push it right to prod, I, I think we should do a little bit of extra validation uh, on things on things here. Um, let's double check that it works in all already cases. Two years in the industry, I wrote many regex. Like, you know what? I'll, I'll run the regression test for you. Let's do that. Let's do that first. But I'm telling you, it's like it it's gonna work. It's gonna work. Um, and not only it's it's gonna work, it's uh, uh, you see, all of my previous tests worked, so you don't really need to worry about that. Probably Interesting. There with, just there is a, probably a problem with the test. I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, you'll see. It's probably so. So it's a bad. What you know what? Let me let's try it in the try now. Okay, uh, maybe the test data is incorrect. So I'll just go here. You know, uh, here is the thing. Let's just replace that with this. There we go. Okay. It's gonna be it's gonna be okay. It, uh -oh. not okay today. Uh oh. All right. Can you help me debug that? Yeah, you know what? Let's let's do that. Let's actually dive a little bit deeper uh, into into what's going on. Um, you know, Raphael's a, a junior developer, you know, so we need to sometimes uh, double check, double check his work. Um, so let's let's actually go in. Um, so I'm going to open up nine as well. Um, it's, it's really, really cool in terms of the ability to basically just go in uh, quickly and easily execute a transaction. So I can click on a specific API that I'm interested in executing. Um, click, click execute. And um, we get a 400. This should have been a valid UUID. Um, we would have expected that to normally succeed. So I think something something went wrong. Um, so what I actually have running and what we've configured uh, ahead of time within uh, this application is the Rookout uh, SDK or the Rookout agent. Um, what's really cool about that is it's running alongside the application and it gives us the ability to go directly into the, the running application while it's running and debug uh, exactly what's happening under the hood. So let's, let's actually do that um, to, to see if it's, the code is actually doing what we, what we thought it would do. Um, so when I dive into Rookout, um, notice we have a, a server uh, instance running, and we can basically drill into a specific running uh, environment by selecting a specific label. Um, so this is my development environment, um, so I could select that. I can also select, let's say, my, my shipping service. If I had other services running, I could, I could debug those, and I basically just click Let's Go. And that brings us into the debugging view. Um, one really cool thing that it, it did is it automatically went out to GitHub. It fetched our source code repository based on the version of code that's running within uh, Raphael's Kubernetes environment. Um, and I can come in directly to the code uh, and open this up, drill into the specific uh, Java code that Raphael had just changed. In this case, it's the like shipping folders. controller. I like folders. The more folders, the better. <laughs> So then I can I can drill in and and let's look let's take a look. So uh, he added this regex here, so I can see that. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually 
uh, just set a couple different uh, uh, breakpoints. Again, these are non-breaking breakpoints, so that allows us to inspect the application while it's running. And you know what? Let's actually just set one on the if statement, and let's even set one inside the if statement, so that we can see uh, did the regex match? Did it get into our if statement? So I just set a couple, which allows us to kind of step step through different portions of the code. Um, and then I'm going to come back over here, back to my shipping. Um, my shipping API and go ahead and execute that again. Um, so we get the 400 response back and I'll switch back over to Rookout and notice that uh, as we executed that test, it ran this piece of code in the post shipping method and it gave us um, some data back. So we can see all of the local variables, all of their values, uh, much deeper in introspective information in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the application. So notice we set breakpoints on line 50, 53, 54 and 55. So we got one at 50, 53 and 54, but we didn't get into the if statement, which means that we didn't match. Um, so, you know what, let's take a look at this. I happen to have my trusty regex validator uh, up here. So I'm just gonna copy this over into my, uh, my regex validator and I'm gonna copy the UUID uh, from the code that we saw and let's see what's going on. Um, so I'm just gonna paste this in and notice that we don't get any match. It tells us there's no match. And you know what, looking at it, uh, Raphael and his amazing regular expressions, he accidentally put a 13 instead of a 12. So UUIDs should have 12 characters at the end. Zeros and, and ones. <laughs> <laughs> Easy mistake to make from a junior developer. It's, you know, it's, it's understandable. <laughs> so, so, that's, so that's the bug. Um, it looks like you need to go back and fix that, Raphael. So yeah, I'm going to uh, go quickly and just uh, fix it on my end. So uh, here's the 12. Let's push the new image there. And here we go. So we have the new image. And it's going to take uh, 20 seconds for it to start the SSL. Oh, I can actually see. So looking over here, I can see uh, the new instance is spinning up. And uh, I guess the old instance will be uh, spun down. There. Can you see the, the, the new code from the new image just to verify that uh, we got the 12 here? Let's, let's do that. So the new one is right here. Let's drill into that. Click let's go. And again, uh, it's pulling the code from our new commit this time based on the version that's running. And I'll drill back into that uh, shipping controller class. And yes, I can yeah, see that uh, we got a 12 this time. So let's, let's debug that one more time. Um, so I'm going to set a couple breakpoints. Let's make sure we get into the if statement this time. We would expect that it, uh, that it, that it would work. Everything, everything should be, should be uh, kosher now. So let's go back into, uh, into up nine. Let's execute our regression test or our um, our, our, our uh, API test one more time. This time it returns a, a, a 200 response, which is, which is excellent. And even better, we can see that line 55 was executed. So we got a match this time. So that change, it looks like fixed exactly what was, uh, what was broken. Excellent job. Uh, all because of you, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so, very good, we eventually got there. Yeah, so uh, you, you signed this, uh, Funny, uh, small example, you know, uh, first, easy to generate and the, the environment is ready for us, whether it's uh, locally or through App9, we were able to automatically not only see the bug, right, that we're about to fix from, you know, creating a test for it will be two clicks of a button. Then after we committed the code, we were able to find the new bug easily, right? We didn't have to, you know, the regression test it gives us everything that you need. If you had to play with the payload, it was easy for you there. Then the live debugging really allowed us to understand the new code. And there is, there is how you save the time, right? Because the same bug thinks that you will need to go back to this code a week from now, right? After multiple services were committed changes and you'll need to figure out that that regex had to do 12, it will take you significantly more amount of time. The fact that Rookout allows you to see that on your new code, I didn't have to do any code change to mine. It was kind of a one-time thing that the DevOps just integrated Rookout into my Docker 
I don't need to worry about that. It's available for me whenever I need it. Quickly understand the issue, fix it, play with it a little bit, run the regression test, and know that the code is now available all in my service. And I can like update the contract, tell everybody, hey, bug fix, new contract version is up and running for you guys, and then have my coffee. Absolutely. And we had time at the end to enjoy some coffee. So I was right. We were able to get to the bottom of the issue very, very quickly. Um, so we have one more poll uh, that, that I think Noga is going to, uh, to, 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 to kick off here and just to, uh, just to get some feedback on things. So you should see that pop up in, uh, in just a moment. Um, so there it is. And as you guys are answering that one, uh, by all means, feel free to reach out. Um, if you had any questions on what you saw, we'll, we'll take questions here in just a second. But if you have any follow-ups, you want to dive deeper with either uh, Raphael or myself um, and dig more into anything we talked about here or dig into the technologies from Up9 and Rookout, uh, here's all of our contact information. Feel free to reach out uh, at any point in time. And um, thank you. I think Paul. that with that, that wraps us wraps us up. We'll, um, if there's any questions, uh, Noga, we'll hand it uh, back to you for uh, for those questions. Yes, thank you both so much. It was really fascinating. We do have a few questions uh, from the audience, and if there are any questions that anyone still has, you can feel free to put them in the Q and A box. So the first question is from Sri and he's asking, uh, Josh, this is for you about the ID, which ID you were showing. Yes, so what we were showing there was, was uh, Rookout. So Rookout uh, works as a uh, web application. So if you notice, I was going through a browser, I was accessing, I was accessing Rookout. Um, and it's, it's actually not a replacement for your current IDE. So if you're using like IntelliJ or um, you know, VS Code or whatever you're using, it's not a replacement. What it works as is essentially an interface where you can go in, um, open up your uh, source code files. Uh, Rookout never receives your source code, by the way, that just stays locally within your network. Uh, and it allows you to go in and open up your, your files and start to set those non-breaking breakpoints. So think of it kind of like, almost like virtual logging, if you will, where your application is running, you open the code to identify which part of the code you'd like to debug. Uh, and then you set these breakpoints at different areas of the code where you'd like to collect data. Um, and it gives you immediate uh, feedback on exactly what's happening within your application. You know, a stack trace, the, 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 the local variables, tracing information, um, where the service was running, all of these kind of things. So, uh, so it's an IDE-like interface, but it's not, uh, it's not an IDE itself. Great, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Um, I think that was a very clear answer. So Rafael, I have a question here from John. Um, he's saying that they don't implement contract testing, but he's, I mean, he's, he just started out of the company three months ago. So he was wondering how he could convince his team lead to maybe implement contract testing. If there's like a, I don't know, like a, an experiment they could start with, like how would you recommend approaching this? Good question. <clears throat> so uh, first, the demo that we just showed is available on the, uh, uh, um, the the GitHub public repository. So they can literally do exactly what we did here uh, on their environment. The only difference will be is that they'll need to do it on their own up nine account. That's it. And uh, to, to kind of explain why to do the contract testing is Right now, if you will not do contract testing, you will end up with a mesh of services with unit testing, and at the best case, some UI testing that covered your application. Um, when you get into that complexity, you need, <clears throat> you need to be able to do uh, a lot of work in order to go back. If you just started your company, tools like Rookout and App9 can become part of your you know, developer culture, right? And it's actually like, developers are not just writing code. It's like the code is like art, right? You just like lawyers will not want to give you a contract that can be shameful, right? And like with a lot of holes or, you know, a doctor when they do the work, they want to do it the best. I believe the developer wants their code to be the best there is. It's just a matter of effort and time pressure. Tools like App9 and Rookout allows them to get to that quality without spending that amount of time. So what you saw right now with uh, App9 you basically install app nine and everything comes to the developer for approval instead of them writing all those tests. All the tests that I showed, the regression, 
were created by App9 automatically, right? It was me that just added them into the collection, kind of run the collection. Uh, so for them, what they will get, one, they will get less time writing tests, more approving them. Think of it like the example of a peer review, the amount of time it takes you to write the code versus the amount of time your peer gets to just approve your code. The second thing, you have a consistent way of releasing with you know, a safety net. Uh, no one goes, like even if you're going all the way to production, you know that you have those regression tests, you run them one after another. When there is a new code, you know exactly that you're gonna get new tests, you kind of validate them, run them locally, and maybe in pre-production all the way to production. So if one thing from here is it allows you as a VP of engineering, CTO, to kind of uh, place that process without the uh, you know bureaucracy of let's uh, let's spend a lot of our time not on that code, not writing the code. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, so we have a question from Maya from Josh. She's asking which programming which programming languages sorry does Rookout support. Yes, yes, good question. Um, so we support a, 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 an array of different language families. Uh, so we support JVM based languages, including Java, of course, and any language based on JVM, so like Scala and Kotlin and, and, and those kind of languages. We also support .NET, uh, both .NET Framework, .NET Core, uh, Python, uh, Node.js, as well as Ruby. Um, and in uh, the future, uh, hopefully the near future, we're also looking at supporting Golang um, and possibly C++. That's, that's incredible. Uh, okay, we have time for one last question and from Lauren. So she, okay, <laughs> she definitely enjoys getting more time for coffee, uh, but she's asking if you can add a bit more information about the performance impact, both of uh, Rookout and of Up9. Sure, sure. I can, I can take it first from the Rookout side. Um, so the performance impact of Rookout is, is relatively minimal, typically under 1%. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with APM tools like New Relic and AppDynamics and Datadog. Um, and so I like to compare it to that uh, and, and show where we're different. Uh, typically, those type of APM tools, they're constantly running in the background. They're collecting a lot of data and information, um, traces, collecting you know, business transactions and uh, pushing those up to a dashboard where you can view and filter all of that information. Um, Rookout is taking a slightly different approach where we try to do as little as possible and have as little impact on your application as we can. So essentially by, by default, when Rookout starts uh, and, you're, and you're running it, think of it just as another dependency to your application and uh, we're really not doing anything. So the overhead is uh, completely negligible at that point. Once you start collecting data, um, start setting breakpoints, the overhead uh, is, is typically the same as if you were to write your own log line on, on that line of code. We're doing something, something very similar to that. Um, so overhead is, uh, is, is, is definitely very, very small and um, typically uh, not a concern uh, to most organizations. Uh, Rafael? Yeah, um, so App9 is uh, operating on the Kubernetes level or the ECS or Docker Compose, uh, the orchestration of your containers. And uh, there are two modes for that. One is the mode that we collect the data. Uh, it's something that you can compare, depending how you install it, it's like a TCP dump. It does not disturb the application itself. I would say it's, you know, somewhere like just installing another, uh, you know, less than a new relic agent because again what we do is basically a tcp dump if you use if you install us using uh, like you know uh, connecting us to like envoy or istio or something like that that's even lower because we don't need the sidecars but the idea is that if let's say you have a docker compose and you want to uh install up nine we'll just spin up a sidecar for that and be able to monitor the tcp dump we basically tcp dump it to the the drive and then the tapper goes take that and send it back uh, to the uh, uh, modeler to create the model. Uh, I would say it's a, you know, something in the lower percentage, one digit, uh, uh, or not at all. You won't see that if you, you're doing it with the Envoy. Great. So we, I did have one last question pop up, so I'll definitely allow it. So Sylvain is asking, uh, what would the integration of your library into source to image capabilities of open shift infrastructures would look like? What's your opinion about it? And is I, that for the... I'm not sure 100% who's that for. Um, 
So if the question, so so if the question is integrating the Rookout SDK um, into an application running on OpenShift, that that should be completely fine, um, as long as it's in one of the supported languages that I mentioned, um, Java.NET, Python, Node, or Ruby. Um, if you're running your application on um, on OpenShift, uh, that that's very well supported for mine. And if it was about the app nine, OpenShift is technically based on Kubernetes, so again, it's uh, just doing exactly the same thing, same uh, same process. Great, thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Josh. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a wonderful rest of your day or rest of your evening, and we will see you next time at our next webinar. Look out for the email with the recording, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.